Exhausted. Are you? Yeah. Um, are you you're still hurting a little bit? Uh, Sometimes more than others. Is the exhaustion from, obviously you're recovering, but you also, I mean, there's a lot going on. Oh yeah, all talk, the time. Talk to me about that. Just a lot of, um, you know, doctor's appointments, interviews, visitations for my friends who are concerned, my family, nonstop calls from my cell phone. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot to deal with. What would you rather be doing right now? Um, I don't know, like at the beach or something? <laughs> or camping. Are you involved in the, the movement uh, dealing with, the, with uh, gun control? Oh, absolutely. Okay, what's your involvement? What are you going to do? Well, um, I'm going to encourage all my peers to one, register to vote because in this country it apparently takes a piece of paper to change anything and um, I'm also encouraging my friends to participate as many rallies and marches as possible because I myself will be at marches and rallies and I will be petitioning as much as possible. Um, definitely make as many appearances on whatever media outlet I need to so that my message can be spread across all platforms and not just like specific ones and definitely encourage everyone to, you know, put their money where their mouth is, I suppose. Okay, so what's the solution here? What's uh, <laughs> the Samantha plan for controlling Samantha's the plan. <laughs> firearms? Um, well, I, I, think it, I don't think it's all about control. I think it's also about preparation as well. Um, an, improve in, an improval in the infrastructures will also help. An improval in security in schools would also help, along with, you know, um, you know, strengthening our gun laws and making them more strict, in my opinion. 18-year-olds, should they buy these weapons? Absolutely not. I mean, they can't drink, can they? Well, they can buy a firearm? That doesn't make sense. Okay, and the, the governor today came out with his plan, but it did include banning the sale. I mean, the sale of... AR-15s right. of assault rifles, military-grade weapons that don't necessarily need to be on our streets. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to have military-grade weapons on the street. They they belong in the war zone. They belong in the arms of people who are enlisted, not civilians who are not trained to hold a weapon of that capacity. Did you know Scott Peterson, the resource officer Yes. What's your reaction to all this? I'm not very surprised, really, because he didn't have much of a presence in the school to begin with. Um, he made no effort to introduce himself to, you know, not only the students, but the faculty. Um, he had very minimal presence in the school. You probably see him maybe once a day. You wouldn't see him patrolling the hallways or, you know, checking on students the way that our actual security, you know, when you go to our school, you always see, um, you know, security guards in their golf carts, patrolling, looking down hallways, checking on students, making sure everyone is where they belong. Peterson, however, I've never had a real encounter with him where he's, you know, spoken to me or spoken to any of my peers. Now, you say security guards. There are, there are campus security guards, yes. like the coach who, who died. Like Aaron Feist, yes. Right. And, and then this is a, a sworn police officer deputy from Broward County and you didn't see much of him. Absolutely not, which is funny because he lives there. You know, you'd think you would see him a lot, but I guess he was just hiding hiding in his home or something. Mm -hmm. Doing could, who knows what. If you could say something to him, what would you what would you say? You failed us. You took an oath and you broke your promise. And that's disappointing. And I'm disappointed in you. But yet the teachers are the ones who were the ones who lost their lives. Yeah, the ones who sacrificed themselves. You know, do you know those teachers? Oh, yes. Which one the best? Beagle. But I was, I was very familiar with Feiss and Rickson. Mm -hmm. They were very, very good gentlemen. I covered Beagle's funeral. He seemed like a pretty, pretty good guy. They, they talked about his dry sense of humor. Yeah, if you will. very sarcastic, very very witty, sharp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Are you uh, going to go back to school? No. No. What, what are you going to do? I'm going to finish the rest online, take the time to recover and, um, you know, advocate for my cause. Uh, okay, so you will, you're going to continue. Oh, school, yeah, I'm right? not going to drop out of school. Yeah, yeah, no, I that's mean, definitely not a part have, of the we agenda. We have to go and things to do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, okay. So you're going to go online. Uh, is, is a school offering that? Uh, I, I, that will be determined Sunday, but prior to the shooting, I had the opportunity to finish school online, so, and then, then this happened, so. So if you go online, you've got time to do things, right? Yeah, absolutely. I can finish the rest of my schooling in a month's time while also traveling and spreading my word and talking to mm -hmm. lawmakers and you know talking to whatever media platforms I need to writing it all down did Donald Trump visit you in the, in the hospital room no, no. He, he did no okay. all right he did call me though he called you yes on the phone yes and he said <laughs> he said that he heard that I was a big fan of his and that I was uh, that he's a big fan of mine as well he also called the shooter a sick puppy. Mm -hmm. um, he wished me well, of course, and I appreciate that, but I, I can't say that I was consoled, I suppose. I feel like our Scott Israel did a better job of that, who actually came to see me in the hospital, and so did like actual you know, mm -hmm. people. Um, but he claimed he was going to visit me and then never did and then um, didn't invite me into the les listening session even though I was shot. So I think that's pretty interesting. Well, you seem like the community a little outspoken. Maybe he didn't want to hear it. I think so. I think he might be afraid of me. But you know, it's, it, I, I come from a whole real different generation <laughs> than you, and it just amazes me how this president doesn't have respect of, of a lot of people in the country. It's, it's quite unfortunate, really. But um, I, you know, he is the president. I do respect him, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I just am unimpressed by his efforts. And I would be more impressed if he tried to do something to change the way that everything is going right now. And if he would just join our side and try to make a difference in any way he could, except He's, he's not, though. I was struck by the, the night that we came up here, the Valentine's Day night. I got here at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, and I was struck talking to parents and to the kids who were coming out of the school. It's, uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but it seemed like every one of them knew this kid, this Nicholas Cruz. Absolutely. Did you know him? Yes. Briefly, obviously we weren't friends, but we existed within the same JRTC program. Um, he was friends with some of my closest friends and they hung out and it was very clear that he was mentally unstable. And we did everything as students and as faculties to report him and to get him out of our school, but it wasn't enough. Did, did you report him? Did you or your friends? I, you yeah, know. my friends reported him, mm -hmm. yeah. And what was your reaction when nothing happened, or did you just sort of get swept Well, we it? assumed that something did happen, because he was expelled from the school, and he was put into, you know, he was put away, so in our minds, we were safe, you know, we thought that the system had done their job, we thought that our words were enough, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, when he was kicked out of the school, that's when we thought, oh, okay, our, our school is going to be fine, and um, mind you, this was the, this, you know, this kid this man, rather, would bring live ammunition to school. He would get mm -hmm. fights with, you know, kids. He would threaten people I knew, threatening to kill them, threatening to murder them and rape them and do all kinds of horrible things. So the moment he was off campus, we were under this impression that we were safe. Like, mm -hmm. um, but we were wrong. Um, and we thought that the either the local authorities or the FBI or or some mental institution would take him away and do something. But obviously, we're not keeping track of Nicholas Cruz because we're high school students. That's not our job, mm -hmm. you know? So the moment we thought he got expelled was the moment we thought it was handled with. So as students, we, we would have had, of course, we knew him to be a very dangerous person. And even kids would joke about him being the school shooter, but we lived in one of the safest communities in South Florida. We never thought it was going to happen to us. Parkland. Parkland. Have you talked to your mom or 
human close to you. Uh, and I'm just saying this because I've lived a lot of years. It, your life has changed forever. Absolutely. Um, my whole, my whole point of view, my whole, I've, I've been given an entire new set of eyes, you know, because, you know, unfortunately, the American media and society and, you know, everyone around you is desensitized, you know, our children to school shootings. We have, we are put under the impression that this is a regular occurrence, that this is something of normalcy, and it really is not. And the truth is, is the only reason it seems normal is because it happens so often. And then it happens to you. And that's when the reality really sinks in. And that's when you realize that these, that these lives that are lost are more than just statistics. They're human beings. They're human lives that we're losing right before our eyes. You know, the future of America. And it's not as real until it happens to you. So definitely my life has been changed and it's, it's, it's propelled me forward to do bigger and better things because I was never really pressed on the issue prior to the shooting because I was under the impression that there was nothing for me to do. I had no voice, that we were too young to say anything, but we're not too young. It's never too early. Our founding fathers were in their 20s. I mean, this is not anything new. You know, as Americans, we've overcome so much together and this isn't something we can't overcome. This is something we definitely can overcome. You know a lot of these young people that are going on TV and quite articulate. Oh, absolutely. Stoneman Douglas's students are probably the sharpest, most articulate children I've ever met. Mm -hmm. You know, we're one of the highest ranking schools for a reason. And that's because we're, we're very smart and we know how to use our words and when to use them. Well, okay, you, we've had Sandy Hook, and we've had Pulse Nightclub, and we've had other shootings, and nothing really moved the needle, I guess is the saying that's popular right now. This seems like it's moving the needle. Absolutely. Well, why is that? Because we have so many people behind us. We have so many people supporting us, so many people, you know, wildly motivated to make a change. And I think maybe in the past we did, but there's something different, something different. And it's, it's the passion. It's the, it's the, 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 the tenacity of these students. You know, we have, are a very dedicated bunch. We are a very passionate bunch. And that's, that's our motto. It's be passionate, be proud and um, be, let's try again. <laughs> this is the motto of our school. It's be proud, be passionate, be proud to be an Eagle. And that's exactly what we are. But you guys are pretty tight. Oh, very tight. I mean, you know, even tighter than before, I think. Well, of course you are. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, you have made friends now. You, I mean, you, you don't just have friendship. You're, you guys are welded together. I mean, frankly. Absolutely. We're a because force to be reckoned with. And you believe that? Absolutely. We're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. We will be everywhere and anywhere all the time all at once. And you're gonna have the time to do it. Absolutely, because mm -hmm. I'm dedicating all my time to it. Anything else you'd like to say? Mm. No. We good? I think we're good, yeah. And I didn't repeat any questions. No, you didn't, you did a really good job. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. All right, Ebenezer, I think we're good. Um, you can, you, can you describe that day? Sure. Um, I was sitting in Holocaust history class. We were probably only 20 minutes after 20, or 20 minutes after 2. It was almost dismissal time. And we were talking about different hate groups that um, uh, kind of work out of Florida, what campuses they target, like what their message is. And then after that, we were talking about the 1936 Olympics. And uh, we were talking about how certain Olympians were denied access to the games because they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And we were working on uh, the computers, answering interactive questions. Um, and that's when I heard two uh, shots fired in the hallway. The first two shots, like, everyone in the room froze, right? Everyone was under the impression it was a drill. That's what we said to each other. And the third shot was fired, and that's when we knew that it wasn't a drill. 
Um, and at that point, I lifted myself from the seat, which is directly in front of the door, because I was responsible for opening the door um, when students were to go to the bathroom and such. And I ran forwards. I darted forwards because I panicked. And um, that's when I realized I made a very fatal mistake because it was um, not the right place you're supposed to hide during a shooting. You're supposed to hide like behind the door so that when the shooter looks into the room that you become pretty much invisible. It looks like no one's in the room, but I r ran forwards. And that's when he uh, shoved the barrel of his gun through the window of the door and started spraying pretty um, indiscriminately across the room. There was about um, probably like 12 students uh, who had the same idea as I did and ran forward towards the window, towards the open area of the room. That's when, when I heard the shots firing, that's when I like dove to the floor and most likely bruised my eye and cut my forehead because there's a lot of ends of tables and desks and things like that, very hard to get around. Um, then I started to crawl as he started firing um, until I finally made it behind like this wooden podium that was in the corner of the room. Um, there was only two things for us students to hide behind, which was a small wooden podium and a laptop cart that were about only two feet across from each other. About, um, about like two students hid behind the laptop cart and about six of us hid behind the podium. And just the small space in between is where Helena and Nick were standing and that's where they were shot and killed right next to me. Everything that um, hit them ricocheted and hit my legs and into my face and into my arm. Um, and uh, I remember not being able to hear almost promptly after. And I remember like looking up from the podium because I couldn't hear. I didn't know there were shots being fired. So I looked up and I looked in the window and I saw him like firing through the window. And then at one point he stopped firing altogether and just like peered in and looked in and then walked away. Did you know who it was? Not initially, no, because I was under the impression there was multiple of them because of how many shots were being fired. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the hospital that, until I got to the hospital that I started making the connections and then it clicked that it was Nicholas Cruz. When you say Nick, this was the Nick, the, the swimmer. Who, who was, who were the two that got shot next to you? Oh, that's Helena and Nick, yes, Nick the swimmer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Nick in the window is a Nicholas Cruz exactly. is, is different. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> but, but Nick the swimmer was the one. Who the one was who was shot year. and killed, and we were sitting only about this distance apart from each other, as you and I are sitting on the couch right now. And when the shooter finally left, that's when, like, the reality started to kick in. We look over, we check Helena and Nick's pulse, but Helena's been overtly shot in the chest, so she. Her pulse was done, but Nick was had a pulse for just a while, and then it was done, and they passed almost instantly at the same time because they were just in a two-foot gap, just two feet, and I was, like, very close to them. And you say they passed. Were, were the, were the uh, first responders there when that happened? Or? No, they were dead before the SWAT team got there. Um, I looked around, and I tried to call my mom, but we had to keep really quiet because we didn't know if he was still out there. I, then I texted her. And then I started to ask people like where I've been shot because the adrenaline was still going. I, can't, I couldn't feel, I couldn't tell because I was bleeding everywhere. Um, and um, that's when I started to apologize for bleeding on everybody and then trying to calm everyone down and realizing that wouldn't work because I look like the way I did. And um, it was probably only 20 minutes until the SWAT team arrived. They were very quick. Um, however, they hesitated when they got to the door to make sure the gunman wasn't in there with us. Um, and that's when they broke open the door and they asked, you know, um, who's been injured and who has a gun? And I was like, I've been injured, please help me. And they lifted me up and told me to run down the hallway and run into the street and you, follow the crowd. Me, to yourself. run, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then... I looked on the ground and there was broken glass and shells everywhere and two girls laying half face down in the hallway, most likely from the two shots fired behind me. I think about this a lot, but there's bathrooms on the first floor and there's bathrooms on the second and there's bathrooms on the third, but on the first floor on that day, the girls' bathroom was locked for no particular reason at all. Mm -hmm. A metal door they could have barricaded themselves behind was locked. And that haunts me. And um, I ran, still shot in the leg with the SWAT team behind me. They're carrying their big guns. And 
I went to the middle of the street and people were trying to touch my face and trying to help me and then I started punching at people because they kept touching me and because the adrenaline and you know finally the paramedics like they cleaned me up and you know got rid of all the blood that was on my clothes and I made it to the hospital and it wasn't until like I got to the hospital and like I got like you know like there to realize like what exactly happened you know because my idea of what happened was a little distorted but the moment I started talking to the off like an officer like it, it clicked like I knew instantly like this was Nicholas Cruz like there was only one gunman like this was a shooting this happened like this happened for real this was not a drill um and they they uh they did a bunch of you know cat scans and x-rays and they went into my legs and opened it up and looked in there and they realized they couldn't pull anything out so they sewed me back up they did a like a fluid test in my knee while i was fully conscious all of this i was fully conscious for um they checked on my eye and they determined that i had shrapnel behind my eye but i wouldn't need surgery at first they were under the impression that i did um i waited only a few hours until i actually got to see my mom and like i couldn't really contact her from my phone because it was still in the classroom. All my things are still in the classroom. and It's still there. I don't really think I'm getting it back. So. Wow. Yeah. So how would Valentine's Day look for you in the future? How would you see Valentine's Day? Well, it's definitely going to be moralized, I suppose. Um, it's definitely going to be a, a day of reflection, a day of... Um, of remembrance but it's still going to be a day of love absolutely you know you can't change that love is so important it's it's what's keeping us going is is the love from the community and our parents and the s teachers and the students and the faculty it's, it's you still have to embrace that love you can't deny it you can't you can't you can't deny valentine's day just because something tragic happened on it because love is what keeps us together it's what unites us what uh, what hospital were you in uh north broward north broward okay so if you have the opportunity to tell Cruz something, what would you tell him? Nothing at all. I don't have anything to say to him. Okie dokie. Yeah. Good question, see?